global news tonight. Fire breakout. An overcrowded prison in Indonesia faces the heat with many lives lost. Code red. The United States president gets a first-hand view on the disaster that Storm Ida has left behind. New rains. The Taliban draws from its inner high echelons to fill top government posts. Partners in crime. Man and his best friend run like the wind in a race like never before. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Danidu Vitanawasam. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from Indonesia as at least 41 people died after a fire broke out at an overcrowded prison on the outskirts of the capital Jakarta. The blaze broke out in the early hours of today at Tangerang Jail when most of the prisoners were asleep. There were 122 inmates staying in Block C, the prison block that was affected far more than the 40-person capacity. Some foreigners, including inmates from Portugal and South Africa, are among the victims. Indonesia's Minister of Law and Human Rights said in a press conference that the embassies of the respective countries had been informed. He also added that multiple rooms in the prison block had been locked and could not be opened as the fire spread. The block housed inmates held for drug-related offences. One victim was reported to be a murder convict. The other found guilty of terrorism and the rest were in prison for crimes involving drugs. Dozens more people are said to be injured and some in the ICU. Now over to Taliban takeover. The Taliban announced the top members of their government in a move aimed at cementing their power over Afghanistan and setting the tone of their new rule just days after a chaotic U.S. troop pullout. The Taliban announced its new government Tuesday, naming Mullah Hassan Akund, an associate of the movement's late founder, Mullah Omar, as acting prime minister. Akund was a foreign minister and then deputy prime minister during the Taliban's rule in the late 90s. Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar will be deputy. Baradar was responsible for attacks on coalition forces, according to the UN, and served eight years in prison in Pakistan. Later, he became one of the group's most prominent political leaders in the peace talks with the United States. The new interior minister will be Shirazuddin Haqqani, son of the founder of the Haqqani Network, which is designated as a terrorist organization by the United States. The Taliban have repeatedly sought to reassure Afghans and foreign countries that they will not return to the brutality of their last reign two decades ago, marked by punishments and the barring of women and girls from public life. But Tuesday's announcement that a group of established Taliban figures would be filling prominent governing roles did not appear to signal a brand new start. Nor did the group's response to protest earlier in the day when Taliban gunmen fired into the air to scatter protesters in Kabul. As hundreds of men and women shouted slogans like, Long live the resistance. These people, the Taliban, are very unjust and they are not human at all. They do not give us the right to demonstrate. They're not Muslims, but infidels. As you can see, the situation we are in. Staying in Afghanistan, the Taliban also opened fire to disperse anti-Pakistan protesters in Kabul. Amid growing tensions in the region, Washington's top diplomat denied reports of the Taliban blocking Americans from leaving. The Taliban on Tuesday opened fire to scatter protesters after hundreds of people gathered to hold an anti-Pakistan rally in the Afghan capital, Kabul. Video footage from the scene shows demonstrators running to safety while heavy gunfire continues to be heard. The Islamic government is shooting at our poor people. The Taliban are very unjust and they are not human at all. They do not give us the right to demonstrate. They are not Muslim but infidels as can see with the situation we are in. So far, there's been no immediate reports of injuries. On Tuesday, hundreds of Afghans took to the streets, holding banners and chanting against Islamabad, as many of them believe neighboring Pakistan supports the Taliban. Anger was also directed at the militant group that seized Kabul in mid-August. For the past few days, women have been holding protests, calling for equality, safety and for their rights to be respected. This comes as the Taliban is expected to announce a government in the near future. Meanwhile, amid growing tensions in the region, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken denied reports that the Taliban blocked Americans attempting to fly out of the country.
Speaking at a news conference on Tuesday, Blinken said Washington was in contact with about 100 Americans who have remained behind in Afghanistan and was making sure they could leave safely if they so wished. We're in direct contact uh, with, uh, with virtually all of them. Uh, we have uh, case management teams assi uh, assigned to them to make sure that those who want to leave can in fact do so. Uh, and as uh, my colleagues have said, uh, we're holding the Taliban to the commitments that they've made to ensure the free passage and safe travel for anyone uh, who wants to, to leave Afghanistan. Blinken added that Washington had identified a relatively small number of Americans seeking to depart. He explained one of the main challenges while attempting to depart was that some of the people lacked valid travel documents, hindering the departure of the entire group. President Joe Biden wraps up a visit to physically and emotionally shattered neighborhoods in New Jersey and New York, where last week's record and deadly floods became icons of a changing climate and a planet in trouble. The U.S. president offers words of comfort and promises of support to the affected. President Joe Biden doled out hugs on Tuesday, reviving his familiar role of consoler in chief during a visit to flood-damaged New Jersey and New York, where he highlighted the ravages of climate change. The threat is here. It's not going to get any better. Putting a focus on domestic priorities after weeks of public attention on the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Leave Americans behind! But hecklers in Manville, New Jersey, some perched above a backyard fence where a pro-Trump flag flew beside them, shouted at Biden about the tumultuous exit from Afghanistan. The United States is still working to get Americans left in Afghanistan out of the country while resettling tens of thousands of evacuees. The president's flood damage trips after Hurricane Ida are a shift from the time spent in recent weeks defending his decision to pull U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Biden is expected to focus in the coming days on domestic issues. We're living through it now. We don't have any more time. At a briefing with local leaders in Hillsborough Township, New Jersey, Biden called attention to the dangers of climate change. Later, during a speech in Queens, New York, Biden drove the point home. The nation and the world are in peril. That's not hyperbole. Yeah. That is a fact. Biden has made fighting global warming one of his top policy priorities and pressed the need for infrastructure and climate mitigation spending. Next week, Biden plans to visit California, one of several states where he has approved a declaration of emergency as drought and record-setting heat on the West Coast continued to fuel wildfires. Again, his main opposition leader said he was open to participating in a transition following a military coup over the weekend as the soldiers who seized power consolidated their takeover. The soldiers who seized power in Guinea over the weekend have consolidated their takeover installing army officers at the top of the West African country's eight regions and various administrative districts. Sunday's uprising saw an elite military unit detain President Alpha Conde, with other top politicians also held or barred from travelling. Conde was serving a third term, having altered the constitution so he could stand, something his opponents called illegal. On Tuesday, the capital Conakry enjoyed a second day of calm. Some military checkpoints were removed and traffic was returning to normal. However, West African countries are threatening sanctions. Leaders from the ECOWAS bloc will meet on Wednesday to discuss the situation. Coup leader Mamadi Doumbouya, a former officer in the French Foreign Legion, has promised a transitional government of national unity and a new era for governance and economic development. He's not yet explained exactly what that entails, or given a time frame. There are also concerns of disruption to supplies of bauxite. Guinea is the world's second largest producer of the ore, which is used in the production of aluminum. But speaking on Monday, Dumbuya offered reassurance. Mining companies are asked to continue their activities. The maritime borders will stay open for the export of mining products. The curfew in mining areas is lifted in order to continue production. International companies involved in the mining of Guinea's bauxite have also reported that their activities have been unaffected. 
Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. South Africa's prison service placed former President Jacob Zuma on medical parole less than two months after he was jailed for contempt of court. With that, the current president welcomed this parole. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has welcomed the medical parole granted to his predecessor, Jacob Zuma. Zuma, serving a 15-month sentence for contempt of court, was granted the parole because of his ill health. Last month, prison authorities said he underwent unspecified surgery at a hospital outside prison, where he'd been sent for observation. The 79-year-old remained in hospital with more operations planned, but the Department of Correctional Services said he could receive further treatment at home. We have uh, also received... Speaking on Monday, Ramaphosa said the ruling African National Congress had noted the decision. Zuma was jailed for defying a constitutional court order to give evidence at an inquiry investigating high-level corruption during his nine years in office. His incarceration prompted protests by his supporters that escalated into riots involving looting and arson, events that Ramaphosa described as an insurrection. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson set out plans to raise taxes on workers, employers and some investors to try to fix a health and social care funding crisis, angering some in his governing party by breaking an election promise. For further details on this, we now cross over to Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Ranusha De Silva reporting now from Kent in the United Kingdom. Yes, Danidu. After spending huge amounts of money to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, Johnson is returning to an early pledge to address Britain's creaking social care system, where costs are projected to double as the population ages over the next two decades. He also moved to try to tackle a backlog in Britain's health system, which has seen millions waiting months for treatment from the state-run National Health Service after resources were refocused to deal with those suffering from the coronavirus. British politicians have tried for years to find a way to pay for social care. Those successive Conservative and Labour Prime Ministers have ducked the issue because they feared it would anger voters and their own parties. Ignoring loud disquiet in his party, Johnson outlined what he described as a new health and social care levy that will see the rate of national insurance payroll taxes paid by both workers and employers rise by 1.25 percentage points with the same increase also applied to tax on shareholder dividends. Back to you, Danidu. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Ranusha De Silva reporting from Kent in the United Kingdom. Three quarters of people over the age of 16 in Australia's New South Wales have now had at least their first vaccination dose. The state reported today along with the first rise in new infections in three days. Let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia for more. Yes, Danny. Australia has locked down Sydney and Melbourne, its largest cities, after outbreaks from the highly infectious Delta variant in June ended months of little or no community transmission. The country now aims to live with rather than eliminate the virus once it achieves broad vaccine coverage of about 70% of its adult population of 20.6 million, a goal it is expected to reach by early November based on current rates. New South Wales reported over 1,400 locally acquired cases, up from 1,220 a day earlier, while cases in neighbouring Victoria dipped to 221 from 246. The latest pandemic modelling by Bernard Institute showed without lockdowns or rapid vaccinations, there would have been an estimated 590,000 more cases and 5,800 deaths in Sydney's 12 hard-hit western suburbs over the six months to December. So far, 139 cases and nearly 30,500 cases have been reported since the first case of the current outbreak was detected on June 16 in the state. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. South Korea is currently giving Moderna and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines to adults under 50. But concerns have been raised amid reports of the rare side effects of the so-called mRNA vaccines causing inflammations in the heart. South Korea has seen a few rare cases of people reporting heart issues after getting mRNA vaccines. So far, nine people in Korea have reported symptoms. 
of the so-called myocarditis or pericarditis. Only two were acknowledged as actually being linked to their COVID-19 vaccination. But what exactly are these two heart inflammatory disease? Pericarditis is the inflammation of the outer part of the heart, and myocarditis is the inflammation of the heart muscles. A severe chest pain, breathing difficulty, and a rare abnormal heartbeat are common symptoms in both cases. Experts think those pains are not easy to distinguish from general muscle pain, meaning it's necessary to get it checked. According to the U.S. CDC, around 4.1 people out of every million people vaccinated show rare heart inflammation. The expert added that these two common heart diseases usually improve by themselves. The benefits of a vaccination still outweigh the risk of side effects, stressing that there is a much higher chance of having heart problems if you catch COVID-19. The vaccination not only stops this from happening, but prevents other serious complications from COVID-19. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korean health authorities say that supplies will not be an issue in achieving the goal of administering first doses to 70% of the nation before the Chuseok holiday. The latest arrival is the batch of 3.4 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Just weeks ago, new COVID-19 patients were overwhelming South America's health systems and thousands were dying of the virus. But now almost all South American countries are seeing a sharp fall in new infections. Experts are trying to find out what has caused such a drop. The U.S. State Department says U.N. sanctions on North Korea will remain in place. According to Voice of America, the State Department said it will continue to implement the sanctions through diplomacy at the U.N. and with other countries. Myanmar's shadow government has called for a people's defensive war against the country's military, which the ruling junta has dismissed, describing it as an attempt to simply seek global tension ahead of a meeting at the United Nations General Assembly. More evidence has emerged of human sacrifices taking place during Korea's Silla era. According to the Cultural Heritage Administration, the remains of a woman were found near the west walls of Welsong Palace. The International Atomic Energy Agency reported that Iran has continued to increase its stockpile of highly enriched uranium in violation of international accord designed to prevent Tehran from developing a nuclear bomb. China's exports unexpectedly grew at a faster pace in August thanks to solid global demand, helping take some of the pressure off the world's second biggest economy as it navigates its way through headwinds from several fronts. China's exporters were unexpectedly busy in August. Data out Tuesday showed overseas shipments rose by more than a quarter year on year. That was well ahead of the 17.1% forecast by analysts and also a big jump on July's figure. The world's biggest exporter has staged a strong recovery from its health crisis-driven slump. But economists were worried that fresh outbreaks and rising raw material prices could crimp growth. Instead, exports of consumer electronics, furniture and other goods have all rebounded. A recent gridlock at major ports also seems to have eased, giving shippers a boost. Even so, manufacturers remain under pressure, partly due to the global shortage of computer chips. The service sector has also slumped into contraction again. As a result, many economists bet that China's central bank will soon take further steps to lift growth. And finally tonight, dogs overqualify any friendship checklists made out there, while most pet parents would be happy with them just being adorable. There is much more to their being. Dogs can be great athletic partners, be it a jog, a walk, a trot, or even a race. A case in point was a special six-legged race hosted in Croatia that has people online swooning. Humans along with their furry friends participated in an end-of-summer event that involved activities on both land and in water. Hosted on the beach of Krik Venica, 13 teams took part in various rounds of events consisting of swimming, running, and speed-eating drinking contests. People ran with their pet on the pier before plunging into the sea for the event hosted at one of the country's few dog-friendly beaches. The games were not just fun for the pet owners, but also for the poochers, who could gorge upon their favorite treats like ice cream. Citizens online couldn't stop showering love on the four-legged athletes, some even joking they should be made into a sport at the Olympics. Others hoped similar events would be hosted in their city. 
that is all from us here at World News. Suzanne Chanali will be back tomorrow with a new edition. Until then, stay safe and protect your loved ones. I'm Danny Dutanwasa. Have a good night.